Thank you. Uh, the first thing I want to do is apologize for my appearance. Um, this is not what I usually, well, it's what I often look like, but what, not usually what I look like when I'm making presentations. Um, I'm in the middle of a winter camp with my uh, eldest son, who's the patrol leader for his scout troop right now, and we've got three boys that are trying to do their below zero hero tonight. And so they're going to be out sleeping outside at Stern Scout Camp, and so I'm going to be doing that. I spent last night in a uh, sleeping bag, and so I'm a little bit cold right now, and that's why I look like this. I was going to shave, but I figured any slight amount of insulation just might help me in my uh, endeavor here. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Dean Sather. I am an archaeologist. I uh, have been doing archaeology for about 20 years here in the state of Minnesota, North Dakota, pretty much throughout the entire Midwest and the, the Plain states. Uh, prior to, I, I did my undergrad at Moorhead State University in Moorhead, Minnesota, under the tutelage of Dr. Mike McClovick, and I got my master's degree from the University of Kansas. A sympathetic, oh, what hell. Uh, Kansas was a lovely place, but had I been there for any other reason for grad school, I'm sure I would have loved it. Um, got married when I was down in Kansas, so I'm a, I'm, I'm a husband of one, father of three. Uh, I've got three boys, 13, 15, and 17. Another sympathetic, aw. Oh. Um, and they're all in scouts, and so that's why I do these things. We moved down to the Twin Cities from Fargo back in 2008. I got a job working at a firm called Westwood Professional Services. I was hired there as their archaeologist. Prior to that, I actually lived in the nonprofit world. I ran the Becker County Hysterical Society. <laughs> we all know how these things are run. Yeah. <laughs> Love the nonprofits. I did that for four years. It was a wonderful place. I enjoy it. It's the one true job I've ever regretted having to leave. Um, three boys, nonprofit. We know how this works. Um, the stupid thing was is that I went from Becker County Historical Society to the Yumcomst Museum in Moorhead. It was a lateral move salary-wise, but I didn't have to drive 80 miles a day to get to and from work. And I got, this, I got to play around with that really big boat that they sailed to Norway back in 1982. So this is kind of fun for me. This is, I'm, I was really pleased with this opportunity and I would really want to thank Mary Lou uh, for giving me this opportunity because this is the one thing I miss about moving into consulting is that I don't get to do the presentations that I used to do. And so I am a consulting archeologist now for a firm called Mergent. They are located in downtown Minneapolis and we do all of the environmental work for all of the projects that you see around. I'm not doing the 101 highway, so don't ask me about it. <laughs> we'll talk about it, I'm sure, in a little bit. But I will actually send crews out for transmission lines, pipelines, highways, new construction, because we are there to make sure that people are not going to be disturbing significant cultural resources as they start doing their building. So I'm here to tell the story about the people that lived in this area in prehistory. Now, one of the things that we have to do is that we have to go back a little bit further in time. And I'll tell you, there are two ways that we can approach this. I can go after the fully academic and give you the archaeological gospel, but I can tell you right now, you'd be asleep in five minutes. I did my master's degree on the manufacture of stone tools at a 4,000-year-old site on the banks of the Red River in Norman County, Minnesota. I took 2,388 individual tiny little debris flakes that were recovered from a 4,000-year-old deposit, and I measured them 28 different ways. I split them into categories as to what kind of rock they were so that I could prove that they did the same thing when they, before they got to the site and after. See, now look at this. You're all, you've, you've already got that look on your eyes. <laughs> so that's not the path we're going to take. And unfortunately, my computer is not compatible with the system, so I have to work without props. So I'm going to have to ask you to use your imagination until my, my visual aids arrive. Are you all willing to work with me on this? Okay, so we're going to go back, and we're going to go back and talk about where people came for the first place. Minnesota prehistory. Integral with, okay, um, how many of you think the Native Americans recognize the corporate boundaries of the state of Minnesota? Nobody did. Nobody did. 
And that's one of the reasons that we have to go back in time, because one of the things that happens is that people don't recognize those boundaries in prehistory. They're moving about, they're following their bliss. They're making their livings, just like we are. So the first thing that we have to ask is where, according to the rules, according to Hoyle in archaeology, did Native Americans come from? Where did the humans that occupy North America come from? And the best guess that we have is, of course, from Asia. There's a lot of uh, genetic similarity. There's a lot of physical similarities. And so there's a lot of similarities between the people that are the Native Americans and some of the Asian populations back in Beringia, back in uh, the Ukraine, up in the Siberian Peninsula up there. And so what we're looking at is when did this happen? Now, I'm not going to mince words. There are a lot of Native American myths and legends that say that they've been here all, their t all the time. We're not questioning that. What we're looking at is what do we have archaeological evidence for? And one of the things that we're looking at is that we don't have the archaeological evidence that we need to pursue it. We understand that a lot of the Native Americans that came into North America probably got here about 15 to 18,000 years ago. And that's a little period. Here's, you ready? Gloss over with uh, academic language. It's called the last glacial maximum, the LGM. It's the last time that the glaciers were at their maximum extent in North America. And that was about 18,000 years ago. Beautiful. At that time, we had four miles worth of ice sitting above Canada, right above Hudson's Bay. Hudson Bay is what? It's a dimple on the surface of the Earth that was created by four miles of ice pushing down on the crust. Hudson's Bay is slowly rebounding, and eventually it will drain. The Red River will reverse its course and actually become part of the Mississippi drainage again. But there was a lot of water locked up in those glaciers. And one of the things that happened is that with all that water that was locked up in the glaciers, it wasn't in the oceans anymore. The ocean levels worldwide dropped about 150 meters, close to 400 to 500 foot. What does that do to the shorelines of North America? Makes them huge. So the shorelines of North America were actually extended several miles out into what is now the ocean. And when all of a sudden you see all this water locked up there and all these islands poking out, there are people living on the coastlines in Japan and in Russia that all of a sudden see these new resources showing up. And they're, they're watching this and they're adapting to it. And they're used. They're, they live in a maritime environment. They live along the coast. And so they just kind of bounce their way along that coast. And eventually they bounce their way into the coast of North America. Because part of what happens with that 500 foot drop in sea level is that uh, Alaska and Russia are joined by a land bridge called Beringia. Now, when I was a grad student, or even when I was an undergrad, back when the world was still in black and white, the idea was that all of these people that were living in Russia tooled across that land bridge called Beringia and then kind of found this corridor. They called it the Ice Free Corridor that went between the big ice sheet that's over uh, Canada and the big ice sheet that was over the Rockies. And there was this 100 mile wide corridor between them. And for some reason, they had this picture of all these critters going, hey, tooling on down that corridor into the main body of North America. And so, of course, if you're looking at these large critters doing that, what do you do? You follow them, because that's what you're eating. You're eating the large critters, so you follow them. The problem with that picture, how many of you have ever been near a glacier? What's it like? It's cold. It's dry. What it, what's it like outside right now? They're in the front of a glacier. It's cold and dry. When you have this ice-free corridor that's about 100 miles wide between these two continental glaciers, that corridor is going to be a cold, dry, nasty place. And I can almost guarantee you that there isn't anybody that's going to stand on the northern end of that and think, I can make it down there. If I run really fast, I'll get to the other side before I desiccate, before I become dust myself. No, the prevailing theory now is that they came along the coast. And they could do it a lot quicker. And it makes sense archaeologically from what we have, because the oldest site that we have in North America, right, in, excuse me, in the Americas right now, is this place called Monte Verde, down on the southern coast of Chile that's about 15,000 years old. They have handprints in the dirt at this site. They have footprints. They have house structures. 
older than anything that we found in North America. That proves I'm right. <laughs> so what we're looking at is that we have these people coming into North America, and so we have these sites that unfortunately, and this is the best part of archaeology, you can't prove me wrong, <laughs> because the sites that are very likely to have been occupied by these people as they were coming along the coast are now under 500 foot of water on the continental shelf. Now everybody says, why don't we just tool on out there and look for them? The unfortunate thing is, that wave action is an extremely dynamic process, and it does not leave things that come into contact with it in very good shape. And those sea levels didn't rise like that, they came back over centuries. And so a lot of the archeological evidence that we would need to find out who these people were, where they came from, and what they were doing is really lost to us, unfortunately. So we're looking at this, and one of the things is, so now we're trying to figure out, okay, where did these people come from, and what were they doing? We have a great understanding that we think people came along the coastal route, they were kind of tooling their way around, and we were going after that. But from a North American perspective, we don't really have any evidence of that, what they call pre-Clovis. And we'll get to that in just a moment. What we're looking at is, what was the first kind of continent-wide occupation do we see occurring in North America? What we're looking for is that we look for that evidence. And one of the first things that we find in North America is this thing called Clovis. How many of you are familiar at all with Clovis points? Okay, there's a couple of you out there. Clovis points are remarkably large spear points. And there's something that are, find, that are found across the continent. You can find them practically everywhere outside of the glacial covered areas in North America. And the thing about the Clovis points is that they were very large, very large spear points. Now the reason I like to bring this up, and one of the reasons that I think is extremely important, is how many of you have ever been poked by something really sharp? Did you enjoy it? Did you find it painful? Did you want to slap the person that poked you with something sharp? Yes. Were you twice as large as the person that poked you? Yes. This is the reason that it becomes important, because when we start looking at these things, we'll go through this. Uh, number seven, if you would, please. That's what we're looking at. Now look at that thing. That is a massive spear point. The thing is huge. And the reason it has to be huge, give me number eight, that's what they're going after. Y'all seen bison today? Bison today are this little critter right here. Cute little critters, aren't they? Fluffy, cuddly. The ones that they were hunting about eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 years ago were twice the size of that thing. They were called bison occidentalis. And quite frankly, you don't want to be anywhere near them when you're poking with something sharp. So when you're hunting these critters, you want something on the end of a spear point that you can hurl with great force and throw at these critters because you don't want to be standing next to it going, ah, because they're going to move their head and you're going to go, ah. And that's going to be the end of it. And they're going to walk away going, eh. So they want those things. They want those things really bad. You're going to be, are you, you get to be my navigator today? Sure. Throw me number nine. So one of the things that we like to see is this, this traditional picture of the paleo Indians going out after these large bison, bison occidentalis. They're huge critters. I mean, they are a supermarket on hooves. So of course, this is what you want. And one of the things that we look at is that when you talk about the people coming along the coastlines and doing this maritime navigation, you know, they're kind of coming into North America, they're migrating along the coast, they're taking advantage of so many different kinds of resources. They've got shellfish, they've got tuna, they've got fish coming in there, they've got the, the rich environment right along the coast, but they're diverse. So what the thing that we're looking at is maybe Clovis people weren't the first folk to come into North America. They may not have been the first culture to come into North America, but they may have been the first successful group of people to leave that coastal environment that they migrated in and move into the inland portions of North America and find these huge critters there and rapidly adapt to hunting them. So that rather than having these little sporadic things along the coast, these little places up in the mountains in Monte Verde up in Chile, all of a sudden now, number 10 if you would please, 
we find that we find people successfully hunting bison. See this thing? We're going to talk about that in a little bit. They weren't here when Clovis people showed up. Who brought the horses here? Spaniards. The Spaniards did, 500 years ago. So let's keep in mind, that's why I ask if you've ever been stuck by something sharp. They didn't have horses. They couldn't really get up close to these things and just hunt them like they did there. They actually had to go from a far distance or they had to corral them and somehow dispatch them that way. Go ahead and give me the next one if you would. So they might run them over a cliff. And so you can see how they do that. They've been doing that. They did that back in paleo times as well. They might actually herd those critters because bison run in herds. You've heard the stories of tens of millions of these critters on the plains. Now all of a sudden you get them out into areas in the western Nebraska, Wyoming, Colorado, and all of a sudden you have these large escarpments that are out there on the plains. These people would actually go ahead and create drive lanes. They'd have, oh, how would you like to be this guy? Okay, you're in charge. So you got to get this guy and that guy to get as many bison sequesters as you possibly can and moving in the direction you want them to. Now I want everybody else in the room to create about a three mile line going back in both sides this way and light fires. And as soon as these guys start yelling and hollering and have their bison come, in sequence you go, ah! And you keep those bison going in one direction towards that precipice until finally they end up down there and they fall down to the bottom. Number 12, please. And you get these huge bison bone beds at the base of these escarpments. And you'll find Clovis and Folsom points embedded in some of those critters. They had to do this from a distance. And so you get these large spear points. That Clovis point and that Folsom point, really important because they had to be able to withstand being thrown. They had to withstand possibly missing the bison and being retrieved because these were not easy things to make. But they also had to be able to hit a bone inside that bison and continue its process to get inside and create the damage to actually take that critter down. They were adapted, they were very good at it, and they succeeded at that for thousands of years. Folsom and Clovis. Go ahead and bring that up, next one up, please. Oh. Folsom. It, that's that other point. I, can we go back to that one? Up a little, go up a couple more. Let's get to those points. Next one up, there it is. Clovis and Folsom. Now, here the, here's, how, here's how you can tell. This is the fun part. And this, you ready for boring? Here's boring and esoteric. I'm telling you, you're, some of you are going to sleep. <laughs> if it's my wife, tell her I'm not here. <laughs> this unit right here, you see that? That's a single flake that's taken off the bottom of that point. It's called a flute scar. Same thing here. You see it on the Folsom? goes all the way up the edge of that thing. See, look at that. And what they think, I mean, there's numerous debates about what that flute scar is, but a lot of people think it's the buttressing of the spear shaft going up around that point to actually make it a stronger point, almost like a harpoon. That is something you see. That is indicative of those paleo Indian people, that flute scar on their projectile points, those spear pads. Those are really important. Now, 18,000 years come and go. One of the things that happens is that, uh -huh, how many of those big bison are left? None. What else did they hunt? Mastodon? Remember hear, hearing the stories of mastodons? Mammoths? They're all gone. There used to be horses in North America. They're all gone. There used to be camels in North America. They're all gone. One of the problems that happens is that these people come into North America, they see all of these large critters, they become very specially adapted hunters. They're really good at it. But they're getting here just as the glacial period is ending. Now remember we had all those glaciers that came down and covered North Dakota and most of Minnesota? What happened to all the environments between what is now the Arctic and the equator? Did they disappear? No, they shrunk into a smaller area. And so all of the critters and all of the plants and all of the things that people utilized within each one of those areas between the Arctic Circle and the equator were just collapsed from an area from South Dakota to Mexico. And when the glaciers started to, expand, to retreat, those areas expanded back again. And all of those critters found that all of the resources that they had adapted to during the glacial period were gone. Now there are a lot, there's a long time ago, people claimed 
that when the Clovis and Folsom people came into North America, they were so good at what they did that they killed off everything that was here. They killed off the camels, they killed off the horses, they killed off the bison, they killed off all the mastodons. Not probably true. They probably saw that they became more scarce because the resources that they needed were expanding. And so the critters couldn't actually survive in the changing environment. So one of the things that had to happen is that the paleo people had to learn something different. Give me that next one right there. They had to move into what we call the archaic period, starting about seven, 8,000 years ago. And this is where we start seeing people recognizing the diversity of the environment around them. Now, Clovis and Folsom people did this as well, but now as we get into the archaic, we're talking about people utilizing even more of these resources. They're starting to recognize plant resources. They're starting to look at smaller critters. You know, bunnies are tasty. And so one of the things that they're starting to look at is they're starting to not necessarily pursue a single resource, but they're starting to use a whole bunch of different ones. And those different resources might be scattered throughout different parts of their landscape at different times of the year. Let's go up to the northwest coast in Oregon and Washington. They know the salmon run, but they know the salmon run for a specific period of time during a specific part of the year, and if they are not there at that time to take advantage of that resource, they miss out. And so now we start seeing people becoming a lot more in tune with the immediate needs of how they can interact with their resources in their environment. Same thing's going on here. Does this look familiar? Same thing is going on in Minnesota. We start seeing the people that are living here as the climate changes after that glacial period ends, start recognizing and that climate, the environment starts to stabilize. And of course, we owe our existence to the retreat of the glaciers. I mean, 10,000 lakes, they are here because the glaciers were here. What is it they say about Minnesota? The top 400 foot of Minnesota is Canadian soil. Shh. But as those glaciers receded, they didn't actually retreat back. They actually melted in place, left all these huge blocks of ice that made these depressions that became a lot of the lakes that we have throughout the state of Minnesota. The, the rivers. I mean, the, the Missouri River exists because that was the edge of the glaciers in North Dakota. The Minnesota River, the Mississippi River, they are all responses to that glacial environment, but they all formed specific environments that now all of a sudden have these resources that we can use. Sturgeon, wild rice, moose, moose and squirrel for you folks. We've got all of those resources, and so during the archaic, we start seeing that those resources are across the landscape and at different times they start concentrating on that. And instead of bonding across the landscape for thousands of miles at a time, they're actually concentrating probably within a 50 mile area. They're starting to concentrate down. They're starting to, to shrink their imp impact. They're starting to stay in the local area. Go ahead. And eventually we get into the woodland period. How many of you have a kitchen in your house? How many of you have pots and pans? How often do you take them with you when you go on vacation? <laughs> this is one of the weird things, and this is one of the things I, trust me, again, esoteric, I could talk about this until I blew it. There are hundreds of different kinds of pottery styles in Minnesota alone, and each one at some point has been identified as a culture that lives within our area. But one of the things that I like to point out about pottery is that it really does represent a whole scale difference in the way people were living and existing in their environment. Because pottery indicates staying put. Pottery indicates that people were picking a place to live on the landscape and they were staying there for extended periods of time. They were no longer nomadic, tooling around the countryside, looking for the sturgeon, making sure they're there for the trout, getting there when the blackberries were ripening at the right time, getting there when the geese were migrating, making sure they were there when the ducks showed up, making sure that they were there for the smelt fry or the lutefisk dinner. <laughs> <sighs> but they were, they were actually maybe taking control of some of those resources. The woodland period, this is about maybe 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, people are actually starting to manipulate their, their environment and making it what they want it to be. So instead of having to 
go someplace and collect enough stuff to eat for a little while, maybe they're starting to store things for a greater period of time. Maybe they're actually manipulating the environment to produce the resources that they used to have to wait for at a specific time of the year. Maybe they're taking an active role in making sure that when they're collecting wild rice, they're sprinkling enough of it back into the water to ensure that next year's harvest will be successful. So they're taking a role in this. And also, let's go to the next one, we start looking at where people are. Now this is where, if I put the whole picture up there, you guys would just freak out. These are the recorded, what county is that? <laughs> Those are the recorded archeological sites with the state archeologist and the state historic preservation office. Each one of those dots represents an archeological site that has been recorded and documented for the county of Hennepin. Get a little bit more detail of that. Can anybody point to a pattern? Where are they? Water, you got it. I mean, we got a nice concentration around Lake Minnetonka, and we've got a beautiful concentration along the Minnesota River. Right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Just, I've been in a sleeping bag. <laughs> <coughs> but each one of those represents possibly one of those sites. Now, one of the things is, is with that pattern that you recognize, that we see people living along water, a lot of those are probably going to be those habitation sites. There's going to be some of those archaic sites, there's going to be some of those other ones, but those are fewer and far between. And it's not because they're rare, it's just, well, they are rare, because there weren't as many of them. They didn't last as long. Some of these sites on that map are a single piece of rock that some bozo like me found when we were out doing a survey for a wind farm. Hey, look, <laughs> we found it, stuck a flag in the ground, took a couple readings with a satellite GPS, recorded that site and went, cool. We now know as much about that site as we're ever going to know. Somebody at one point stopped here, broke a rock. Move on. What we're interested in is looking at what some of the details of some of these other sites are. And this is really where the meat and potatoes comes into play when we talk about what people were doing here. Obviously, the water resources in Minnesota are key. Just as important as they are to us today, they were just as important for the people that came and lived here in prehistory. And when we start looking at what they were doing on that landscape, it becomes really important. Go ahead and throw me the next one. There you get some detail in terms of the Lake Minnetonka sites. I will tell you right now, a majority of the sites that are located along Lake Minnetonka are Indian mounds. How many of you know of the town Mound? How many of you know why it's called Mound? <laughs> Not because a tasty coconut candy bar is made there. <laughs> Exactly. Mounds. One of the things that we also start seeing, because remember I talked about pottery really indicating the idea that people were staying put for a longer period of time. Another thing that gives us the indication that people were taking ownership of that land. And I don't want to say ownership in terms of this is mine, but really claiming it as their homeland. This is something they were familiar with. This is, the, this is their backyard. This is where they lived. This is where they, they lived their lives, where their neighbors lived, where their families lived. And one of the other things is that they start making those long-term commitments to that land by burying their dead in rather significant features. I mean, that's one of the things we'll talk about over here with that display that this gentleman has over here, is that all along Lake Minnetonka, you will actually find these burial mounds. Now, here's... This is the dicey part for me. I work in an industry where my job is to go through and find where archaeology isn't. That's what they pay me to do. I'm supposed to find out where things aren't so that we can go through and build a new building. We can put a highway through there. We can do those new roundabouts that are all the rage. We can go through and put a transmission line so that when we flip the switches in our house, the lights go on and off. So that when we turn on the furnace, the gas is there. So we, that's part of the, the industry I work in. And one of the other things that I get to work on is finding out where people can build new commercial structures. And this is the dicey part, especially around this part of the country, is that human burials are protected. 
regardless. It is the only thing in the state that trumps personal property ownership. The presence of human remains can keep you from developing your private property. And the reason is, part of it, you ready for this? The Emancipation Proclamation. Humans cannot own other humans. And it was so broadly defined that that also includes human remains. The human remains that can be owned in the world today have to come from people who specifically granted that permission on their demise. So when we're looking at human remains that are interned in these mounds, they are protected by state law. And they cannot be disturbed unless they are in imminent danger of being destroyed. I'm sure you can all attest and have all heard stories, possibly your neighbors. I know that there was a gentleman that we worked on that wanted to build an addition onto his house and couldn't do it because there was a mound five foot off the back of his house. It's a dicey issue. The cautionary tale I offer to you is that if you're doing any land transactions around Lake Minnetonka, go visit the state archaeologist's office before you close a deal. We also did one for a development, and this was one of the major developers. They were taking this old parcel of land that back in the 1920s was a resort. It had been known for many years. Everybody recognized it. Oh, yeah, it's that place. And this company went in there, and they bought this land from a developer that had already gone in there and started to grade this land, already started to process it, already started to make it into a, a residential neighborhood. And one of the gentlemen that I worked with brought this map over to me and my partner at work and said, uh, I gotta do a stormwater permit for this thing. Can you tell me if there's any archeology span here? Well, we looked at the thing and you can look at it and you go, yeah, you're gonna have some problems there. Oh, there's gonna be some mounds. And sure enough, we went to the state archeologist and we found that there were mounds on this property. And one of the things that was uh, dicey about it is that I was talking about this earlier, the undeveloped value of each one of those property lots was a quarter million dollars. We had burial mounds on five of them. So we had, unfortunately, the potential of saying that he could not develop a million two worth of his property. The state archeologist came out, verified that the mounds that had been recorded there back in the 1800s had been removed, they were gone. And so the um, development was able to go on, but it's dicey because this is what people were doing. When we talk about who they were, and I know that's one of the questions that people wanted to hear, who are these people? We don't know. I know that's it's a real, pardon me, kind of crappy thing to do to you. But we don't know. Archaeologically, we don't know who ties to whom historically. Because people were moving left and right. I mean, there, I mean the, the influence was just amazing. When you talk about the history of Minnesota, there was this wonderful history about how the Ojibwa had come in from the Great Lakes and put so much pressure in the northern part of the state with the fur trade, their involvement in the fur trade, that they kicked the Sioux out of the state almost completely out onto the high plains, and that's why they live out in the western plains now. The problem with that is, is that when you look at the Sioux, there are three divisions of the Sioux tribe, right? The Nakota, Lakota, and Dakota. Each one of those is a language stock. The people that live way out in the western part of the state of North Dakota and Montana and South Dakota are the Lakota. The people that live in the central part of Minnesota are the Dakota and the Nakota. Their languages are almost unintelligible to one another. They've been apart for a long period of time. And so when we listen to the historic pictures of what people said happened, they don't really jibe all the time. And when we start looking at the archaeological record, we have trouble tying a specific pottery type or a specific projectile point, our arrowhead, to any intact culture today. And so the best that we can do is try to talk to the people who claim this as their home, talk to the Sioux, talk to the Ojibwa, listen to their stories and try to find out who was it, what were they doing, how do, what are their myths, what are their tales, what are, what's their history? And so when we look at areas like this, there's a great perception that, you know, in the immediate history leading up to, you know, the strong European occupation in North of Minnesota, is that most of Minnesota, southern Minnesota, was occupied by the Sioux. 
Now, the Metawakanton, the Wapiton, the Wapakude, the Yankton, the Yankton A, all of those folks, all divisions of the Sioux Nation, lived in parts of southern Minnesota. And the thing is, a lot of the things that they did are very comparable to the things that we see here. We see that historic reference. So we can make that link and say, yeah, that's, what, that's who it was. But then, of course, we also talk about Fort Snelling. When did, when, when did they build Fort Snelling? Thank you very much. You got it. That became, I love it. Have you ever gone onto Google Earth and looked at Fort Snelling? Get onto Google Earth. If you ever have a chance, find somebody, get onto Google Earth, find Fort Snelling, and then just start backing away from it. And keep in mind that for 30 years, that little diamond was the seat of the federal government in the entire western half of the United States. That little diamond right there. But that little diamond also was a drawing point. And so right away from the 1820s, from the first time Europeans really started to come in and occupy Minnesota, that started drawing people in. And so that became a magnet. And all of a sudden we start seeing the tribes, the, the Ojibwa tribes of northern Minnesota, taking an interest in trying to get that connection to the U.S. government. Because they're working with the, fresh and the French and the British up in Canada, but now they want to come down and they want to start trading with the United States. And so that Fort Snelling becomes just a center point of drawing people in here. So when we say Minnesota, we can talk about the Sioux. Let's go ahead and get to that next one. We can talk about the traditional ideal of what the Sioux looked like. You know, they were living in their lodges. They were planes adapted. Catlin, of course, was one of the great documenters of some of the activities that were going on. But the main thing I want to get across here, <coughs> excuse me, was that they were just living, you know? Uh, just they, they, they had their house, they had their family, they had the stuff that they had to do to survive. They got, you know, the supermarket of the bison. They had entertainment together. They had their horses after the Spanish came in, but they were just living. And so that's what we're finding archaeologically. Give me the next slide. The Ojibwe were doing the same thing, but maybe in a little bit different environment. Maybe they were more accustomed to living in the woodlands up in the northern part of the state. So their houses take on that flavor. You see the wigwams made out of the uh, birch bark. You see the canoes, which I love. You all seen birch bark canoes? You know where they kept those in the winter? In the lake. They would actually take their birch bark canoes and submerge them into the lake. Because if they left them out here, what's, what's it like outside again? Dry! <coughs> Excuse me. Caffeine. It's very dry, and of course you can't use a birch bark canoe on a frozen lake. So they wanted to make sure that they preserved it, so they would actually weight their canoes down into the lake where it wouldn't freeze. It would keep them moist, and it would actually help seal them up so that when they pulled them back out in the summer, that following spring, all they'd have to do is repatch it with some tar, and they'd be ready to go. Multi-generational in some of those things. And then when you talk about some of the huge ones, there's a gentleman I know, Joe Lagarde, who teaches a class up in northern uh, Minnesota on the White Earth Reservation. 25 foot long, huge critters. And then you talk about some of the voyageurs. You could fit, what, 30 people, close to eight tons of goods into some of those birch bark canoes. Remarkable technology. But people were making their living. Now, I do this because you get dogs, you get people doing things, just making their living. And so what we want to do as archaeologists, <laughs> I love this, go ahead, number 19. We clean the world's garbage up one square meter at a time. If you want to talk about a group of obsessive compulsive people that have severe anal retentive tendencies, it's us. We are archaeologists from the get-go. Because seriously, what we do is that we look for the remains of human activities left on the landscape. And we dig them up very precisely. And we pick up each individual piece, we bring it back to the lab, we draw a little number on it, we put it in a bag, we put it in a bigger bag, put it in a box, put it on a shelf. And there's tons of this stuff in the Minnesota Historical Society. But here's the key. Every one of those stories that we can tell about the Folsom and Clovis people, about the woodland people and their pottery, and the archaic people and the paleo people and the diets they ate, come from activities like this. Mind-numbing, painstaking work. The reason I like to bring that up is because there's a lot of people that collect artifacts. And don't think for a minute that I'm going to get up here and proselytize and say, bad. 
I have relatives in the Red River Valley who have got amazing collections. And one of the things is the serious collectors know exactly where their materials come from. And they can be one of the wealthiest resources that archaeologists can possibly have. All those sites that you saw on that map showing where the sites were, those are the ones that have been verified by professional archaeologists. But I can tell you that there's a lot of people out there who know where a lot of other sites are. And I think we're finally getting past this point where we have people at the state level and the, the federal level who are, you know, shaking their finger at these people that collect. Don't collect human remains for the love of all that is holy. Do not keep and collect human remains. That's just, that's just bad. But I know you've got collections. And one of the things that we'd love to do is see them. Yeah. Hear them, you know. We want to know where it is. Because that's going to probably expand our knowledge of what people were doing in prehistory by an amazing amount, especially those Clovis points. Professionally, we have 11,000 Clovis points registered in North America. We figure there's at least 50,000 out there in private collections. Think what we could learn. Think what we could learn. So we go through and we collect this material. Pardon? Can you please walk through? I, I, I'd like to. <laughs> I hope I am. So we're trying to make sure that we do very delicate work and very detailed work in collecting this. Because it's not just the artifacts, but it's the stories we tell. Those stories we tell become very important. And when we talk about trying to identify the people that were living here, we're not going to be, give you, we're not going to be able to give you a name. We can say historically the Sioux lived in this part of the state. But we can also say historically the Ojibwa were here as well. Let's hit that next one. What we have to do is go back and talk to the people whose history it is to help put that whole story together. This is a map. Is it all clear to you? <laughs> this is a map from a book called Where the Waters Meet. And it's kind of a, a historic description uh, based on interviews with a number of historic Native American leaders about where they live what the culture history was, what are the tribes, what are the, what are the villages that people lived in. Go ahead and hit that next one. And when we get down, look familiar? That's kind of our neck of the woods, and we can start seeing some of the names that might be kind of familiar to us. There's Shakopee. And so one of the things that we can look at is trying to draw that history back together again. Because for a long time, I think the archaeology community and the Native American community weren't really working together very well. Because of the 50,000 human remains that were at the Smithsonian, we probably collected most of those. And that doesn't really set a good precedence when you're trying to say that you respect someone's culture when you dig up their ancestors and put them in boxes. So that's one of the reasons why laws have been passed. It's called Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, back in the 1980s, where we tried to find out who these remains belonged to so we could get them back to those, those people. And it did open some doors. And so as we look through this, Metacota, Wapakanozan, we start looking and bringing those pieces back together, and we can start telling a little bit more of that story. And as you drive through town, you know, mound, yeah. drive through Shakopee, drive through Winona. These are all names that were given to this country by the people that used to live there. Go ahead and hit that next one. And of course, one of the things that we truly try to look at from a different perspective now are those mounds. Now, this is not obviously from immediately the area, but uh, Indian Mound State Park up in St. Paul, you can see kind of the distribution of some of those mounds. We see that ownership, we see that, and that's part of that story that we tell. It's that long history. Humans coming into this country 11, 15, 18,000 years ago. But one of the consistencies that we see with each one of those stories is that it's just people living on the landscape trying to make their lives. And it's us gleaning those little pieces of information from an archaeological record that we're still trying to build a larger picture to say who these people were. Most of the history that we have for the area immediately surrounding 
Lake Minnetonka comes from the woodland period. You know, probably about 2,000 years and later. Probably a lot of them less than 500 years. But it represents those people living along that landscape and taking advantage of all those resources. So do I have a name for the people that used to live here? No. I barely have a name for the people that live here now. I mean, think about it. Who are you folks? How long you been here? How long you going to be here? And that's the fun part of it, is that it moves all the time. And that's the thing I love about archaeology, is that for everything that I learned in grad school, <laughs> it's all wrong now. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I have friends who have, you know, they have their degrees in wetland studies. I've got biologists that I work with. I've got engineers. I'm the soft science guy. My, when I defended my master's thesis, it was more or less an is to is not argument. You know, so I got in a room with a bunch of people and I made my presentation. One guy in the back went, huh, uh, and I went, yeah, and I got my degree. And, <laughs> but what's fun about that is that from a science perspective, and from a way of looking at these things, this is a way that the world changes. And that's one of the reasons why when I tell you, I'm not going to tell you who the people that lived here are because next week that's going to be wrong. The thing is, go out there and look. Go out there and find. Go out there and think. Go out there and talk. Read. Research. Have fun. Ask questions. Because I can tell you that for every archaeologist that's ever going to come up here and tell you what the truth is, there are five others that are going to come in and give you a completely different story. So when I say it was Dean Sather's opinion, <laughs> it is, folks. And next time you talk to an archaeologist, they're probably going to say, Dean told you that, didn't he? <laughs> no, he's wrong. It's a long history. Beautiful long history. 10,000 years of occupation in Minnesota, one for every lake in this beautiful state. And it is as wide and as diverse as anything you're going to find anywhere in the United States. We don't have, you know, everybody complains that we don't have the, you know, the real, we don't have the cliff dwellings, you know, we don't have the Pueblos, we don't have the Chaco Canyons. But I can tell you, when we're working on a site out in Enderlin, North Dakota, that has a fortification ditch dug around it that's over 500 years old, and as we're digging into one of those, give me number 19 again, if you would, please. When we're digging into a fire hearth, that they used at that site 500 years ago. And we, we collect all of the dirt that comes from that remains of that fire hearth. And we put it through a really small screen. And we take all the rest of that material and we put it into water and we float all the organic stuff out of that dirt. And we find seeds. And we find critters. We found a corn kernel and a cob fragment out in western North Dakota that's 500 years old. That little chunk of charcoal changed when corn got to North Dakota from the Central American areas. That's why we do that and that's why that story changes so frequently. So that's an hour. I've left just enough time to ignore your questions. But if you do have any questions, I'd be glad. Yes? Nope, it is, it is remarkably organized. And the reason, uh, here, I'm going to be honest with you, I worked for White Earth for about a year and a half. I kind of have a sensitivity to these issues. And one of the things that happens when you go through NAGPA training, uh, the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act, it is actually unwelcome to represent human remains from archaeological sites. And so I have a tendency not to show the interiors, but I can tell you that as they have, when they have been excavated, it does show a lot of organized effort to put that in there. Um, I don't know how many of you remember when they tried to build uh, a building down by the Mall of America about eight, nine, ten years ago. They found three burial mounds on that property. And they actually wanted, the, you know, this, this land goes for a million dollars an acre down there for development. 
And so they were unwilling to just let that go, and they worked a deal with the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council and the state archaeologist to actually excavate those mounds under the protection and under the direction of the Native American communities and then determine what was going to happen to those remains. They got one of those mounds done. They found 53 individuals, and it cost them almost $15 million to excavate. That mound was reconstructed, and the other two were not touched. They are still there. But they do show remarkable directed building. And so this was probably something that an entire community would do over a period of time. They would go mine that dirt from someplace and carry it there and build that mound piece by piece. And then once that mound was built, they would probably use it again and again as another place to bury their dead. There's a great uh, book, it's called, uh, if you've heard of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or what they call Boss Indians Around, um, there was also a series of publications called the Bureau uh, American Ethnography, BAEs. And back in the 1800s, they published these beautiful volumes on the ethnographic explorations that were going on in North America. And one of them was a mound survey of eastern United States. And in the bottom of some of these mounds, they would actually find lined crypts with limestone. And in one of these, they found this beautiful square crypt that was probably about 10 foot square with eight people sitting in a circle that had been buried there. And then on either side of that crypt were two chambers that were filled with this brown powdery material. And they think in some cases that perhaps these individuals had been buried there, but they had been defleshed and their remains had been put in these chambers next to this burial. And the, when they opened the chambers next to it, they said the odor that had emanated from that crypt caused them to leave the excavations for about a week. So yes, these mounds, most of, almost all of them have a very specific construction. They are, they are built specifically for that purpose. And they don't just exist on the surface of the ground. This is where we get into the, the talk on the 101 roundabout, is that the mounds that were there had been removed. But just as much as there's a mound on the surface, oftentimes there's a portion of that mound that extends down underneath as well. So they would actually excavate out a bell inter the individuals and then start building the mound on top of that. So, it depends. I mean, for the most part, you're probably talking about about six to eight inches. That's for the Clovis. The Folsom points were usually about three, four inches, three inches. And it, you know, here's the kicker: depending on how far away they were from the raw materials, the stone type that they used as to how big or how small they got. But there are some, there was a, a cache of Clovis point points found about 15 years ago called the Roberts, the Ricky Roberts cache. And some of those uh, Clovis points were over a foot long. And of course, here's, here's the other thing about archeologists. If we don't know exactly what's going on, it's ceremonial. <laughs> that's, that's the great cop out that we have. Well, I don't know what was going on, it has to be ceremonial. And so when they're looking at something, you know, a spear point that's a foot long, you don't, you don't hurl that at something. That, that's not going anywhere. And so they think that that was either a raw material, so maybe they were taking flakes off this large flake and using those as expedient tools, or perhaps those were <laughs> ceremonial, and we don't know what they were for. Pardon? Or you drop it, yep. So... Any other questions, concerns, complaints, gripes? Oh, yes. Up to the canoe mm -hmm. found in North, over by North Farm, that's over at the sign there. Yep. Um, did that have any indication of tribe or was it birch? Or was it I believe it was birch. Uh, we've had that. Uh, I know the people that were working on that. That was an amazing find. And where did they find it? In the lake. In the lake. Yeah. And so. Was, it was probably sent there for preservation. Actually, the museum I worked on at Becker County Hysterical Society in Detroit Lakes. I'm sorry, it's a, it's a, it's a tick that I have. Um, 
that canoe was actually found in the lake as well. It, and it actually had been pinned down. Uh, the director who developed that museum, his name was Otto Zeck, and he started the museum back in the 40s, worked a lot with the reservation, but he actually found that canoe in a lake pinned into the lake. And so that's the canoe. And of course, in the museum, it just dried out and fell apart. But no, ethnicity, unfortunately, especially with a birch on Lake Minnetonka, could be Sioux, could be Ojibwa, could be a lot older. So, ta-da. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.